time period, they, they start to track alongside each other. And so the net additions and the net subtractions in GPR are kind of washing out. And this, this high growth period of Iceland and high net capital investment, for example, really means that these two track well together. And then in this most current period that we're in, we're seeing a separation again. And one of the overwhelming impacts during this current period is the inequality of incomes. Um, that is something that GPI is corrected for, GDP doesn't care about. Okay, how are the incomes that are generated by a growing economy distributed? And so that's what we're seeing there in, in the split in recent years. So we have six teams. They're each going to come up with one to two speakers, um, give a brief, brief overview of what they did, and then, and then highlight an indicator or two, just to kind of give you a sense of uh, what we've been doing. So, who's first? Come on up. Hi, I'm Svava Bragason. I worked with Elizabeth Reeves and Andrea Hagen on this. And uh, we looked at income distribution, which comprised of the uh, uh, personal consumption an income distribution index, where we use the Gini index, and we calculated a weighted personal uh, consumption where we divided the personal consumption by the income distribution index. Uh, we also looked at the household work, volunteering, and higher education. Uh, looking at the, uh, the personal consumption weighted by weighted by the income distribution. Uh, we can see the, um, uh, the personal consumption is the black line and weighted by the income distribution is the uh, red line. And um, we used uh, data that was pretty good from 19, um, about 1990 onwards. Um, we made some assumptions going back. We had sort of a, a data point here um, for 19, 75, and um, we just assumed that was lower than anything we'd found in the 90s, meaning incomes were more equal at that point, uh, which was something we'd found based on a 1977 thesis. Um, and we sort of made a flatline assumption back from then, and then in the gap between 75 and 88, we just assumed a straight line trend. So there are a number of assumptions uh, in these in these numbers, but where we really see an accelerating trend of income inequality was after uh, 1995. Uh, those numbers um, differ somewhat with, from what's been uh, reported uh, to the OECD and in the official figures uh, released on Statistics Iceland. That's because the Statistics Iceland and OECD figures do not include investment income. Uh, they only include wage income and the biggest change in income inequality has actually been in investment income, uh, which has been somewhat compounded by the decreasing progressivity of the tax system uh, from the late, uh, from the mid 1990s onwards. Uh, so that's explaining the, the difference we have there. And um, we really like to thank uh, uh, Armaldur Kristjansson and Stefan Olofsson for all the work they've done in coming up with those numbers. Now I'll pass off to you. Thank you, Svava. Um, our team also dealt with the additions to GPI. Um, GDP measures commercial child care and, and, and um, household work as it's provided for in the monetized service sector. Um, but missing from the missing is female labor together with a smaller amount of male labor, which occupies an unaccounted for sector of the economy, and that's specifically the reproduction and maintenance of human capital. So just as volunteer time provides a foundational structure for the traditional economy to, th to thrive, so does household work and child care provide for the regeneration of human capital and really what that does is it strengthens the labor force, so it, it allows our, um, our economy to thrive. 
Um, G GPI accounts for um, the intrinsic value of, of childcare and um, un unpaid household work. So um, our, the, the best case scenario would be to use time use survey data to measure household work because GPI calculates the value of household work by multiplying the number of hours um, spent providing child care and um, other sort of domestic duties by um, a shadow wage rate of the equivalent domestic worker. Um, due to the absence of time use data in, in Iceland and also the absence of research on the value of both volunteer time and um, unpaid household work in Iceland. We use data from a 1996 study that was done um, looking at the difference in household work between um, OECD countries and Nordic countries. And we chose Denmark as our proxy country only because they had higher levels of workforce participation rates than other Nordic countries. And as we've um, discovered since we've been here, the um, Iceland has very high levels of workforce participation rates. So we felt that these two that Denmark matched Iceland um, as close as we could get, and we took that number from the 1996 study and had to apply it across the entire time, time series, which you can see um, from the dotted line on this graph. Um, we also did not have any way of valuing um, the wage of a domestic worker, um, so we used a constant wage, wage rate um, and applied that against the hours. So um, our, you know, our major recommendation for both volunteer time, the value of household work, um, and for several other um, val time values um, that are included in GPI is that the Iceland um, begins to collect time use survey data. Um, and I think that would have great implications for um, social research that's happening here at the University of Iceland as well as policy implications um, at the government level. <coughs> So group two. <laughs> I'm Michelle Otis, and this is Lee Goss, and we worked with uh, Gaida uh, from Iceland on uh, the topics of the costs of crime the cost of household pollution abatement, and the cost of automobile accidents. So what we briefly want to talk about um, in terms of crime, which I'll introduce you to, and, and Lee will talk about household abatement, is why would we look at crime? Why is it important to um, look at crime? And more importantly, why is it something that needs to be a subtraction? Well, crime is something that affects what we call the social asset, if you will, of um, public sa or personal and, and public safety in a community, which is something that we know is very highly regarded in all communities. So criminal activity and the costs associated with it um, need to be evaluated and then need to be subtracted. <coughs> um, in terms of uh, coming into Iceland, the context was that Iceland was one of the safest uh, countries um, that we would see, and so we certainly had the perception that, uh, that, that, there would, that, that Iceland could have the opportunity to be a leader or set the example for um, spending related to crime. Um, we also looked at different methodologies for uh, calculating crime, and there was a couple of um, variances. Um, we looked at um, should we count public spending and personal spending um, when calculating the costs of crime, and what we decided was because Iceland actually shows up as one of the safest countries in the world, that public spending is really at a bare minimum, and that um, we would not include public spending in our calculation. We would instead focus on personal spending. So our methodology was to look at um, costs associated with homicides, costs associated with the hospitalization costs for victims, um, also to look at the victimization costs themselves, theft insurance, and security systems. Um, in terms of finding a value for these things, what we discovered was that in Iceland there's actually a compensation program. So if you were a victim of crime here in Iceland, then you can apply through the Department of, Just of Justice for compensation. We felt that that was probably the best starting point, whether we agreed or not, with a human life being valued at 2.5 million kroner, 
was not really um, the point of this. It was really to find a baseline for starting to, to for the calculation. <laughs> so we actually used the Department of Justice.